the beam, you're looking for the target. It's called side lobe canceling. And when you do this, you don't degrade your side lobes. And you don't need much in the way of signal processing. The classical way of doing adaptive array processing is called the sample matrix inversion technique. You don't look for where the targets are. And when you apply that technique for the single jammer case, you get a degradation of your side lobes by 20 to 30 dB, practically all the side lobes. And you need more signal processing. If you had J jammers, you still have the same advantage as you have with a single jammer. And if you do it with the classical way, you get this. Whoops. If you don't have enough samples for your training, you get rid of your main lobe. It's not a very good thing. I worked on also space-based radars. And with space-based radars, we have two receiving antennas. You can get radar maps of the Earth in two dimensions, topographical maps. And here shows the type of topographical map you can get. You know what this is? Rice paddies in Bali. Rice paddies. Here's the beach there. And you see that couple over there? The woman is on the left. She's topless. It shows you the importance of high resolution. I worked on Star Wars, Star Wars, and here's uh, Reagan listening to me. <laughs> Moore's Law. It's amazing what Moore's Law has done. Doubling of number of transistors per unit area. People say Moore's Law is dead. It's not dead. In the next 30 years, we expect to increase the density by a factor of 50. And at the same time, reduce the power per transistor by a factor of 75. It's not dead. Right now, we're getting down to 10 nanometers, and soon we'll have five. Cover that. When I went to high school, I used, instead of transistors, instead of, tu instead of transistors, tubes. I built a... Uh, Armstrong heterodyne receiver with radio receiver with radio with these tubes one inch by one inch by two inch I carry in my back pocket a memory stick 130 gigabytes 128 actually to do this you need a hundred and thirty giga trans transistor 130 billion transistors if you did that with the tubes, it would take 130 billion tubes. At $1 a tube, that would be $130 billion. Right there. And at one watt a tube, it would require 130 gigawatts. That means 130 nuclear power plants. And if you stack them one on top of the other, the tubes, it would go nine times the distance to the moon. I like to throw in a few of my travel slides. <laughs> uh, Chinese opera singer, Tenement Square. I liked her. <laughs> Taxi driver in India. Holy man in Nepal. Tribe woman in uh, Thailand. A wig man in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, north of uh, Australia. You know what that thing is through his nose there? A dipole antenna. <laughs> they have a telephone system going through satellites like our Iridium system. Ours is high frequency, wouldn't go through the rainforest too well. This is low frequency, so it penetrates the rainforest. They are very advanced. She asked me for directions in Sweden. I couldn't help her, but I got her picture. <laughs> <laughs> what about integrated circuits for microwave circuits? Microwave circuits. 
I showed you a big radar where you can put a whole phase array on a chip now. Four years ago, this is four years old. Six, 32 element, 60 gigahertz phase array, all the electronics on one chip. A year ago, they were able to do it for a 256 element phase array at 60 gigahertz. That's a lot of integration, amazing. I call this extreme mimic integrated circuits for microwave. Here's the beams you get. And the future of these chips will only cost a few dollars, a few dollars. Use them in your cell phone, in your Google Glasses. And, and Nokia is selling right now for 5G a 64 element phased array using SIG, SIG technology. You can put all the circuitry for a radar, car radar, at 77 gigahertz on a small chip as shown here. Amazing. Future of these chips only cost a few dollars. Google puts a whole radar on a chip, in a, on a watch, on a watch, Google. They're getting to, get it, we're getting to Dick Tracy when I was a kid. So what's new out there? Metamaterials. What's metamaterials? Man-made materials. We're not happy with what we, nature provides. We want to improve on nature. It's materials on demand. How do you do this? Well, you have an array of small structures in a substrate, as shown here. And the size of these has to be smaller than a wavelength, the wavelength you want to use it. When you do this, these structures act like new molecules and provide properties you don't get in nature. For example, you have an array of wires, you get a negative epsilon, an array of split circle uh, rings, you get a negative mu, and the two together, you get a negative index or refraction. Negative index or refraction. What does that allow you to do? It allows you to get an invisible man. Invisibility, that's part of it. How does that work? You have a target here you want to hide, surrounded by this metamaterial here. When the microwave signal hits it, it goes around it as if that signal wasn't, the object wasn't there and you don't see the target, no reflections, becomes invisible. And you do this, hopefully, at microwaves and at optics. The first time it was demonstrated actually was at microwave uh, frequencies. And here we see it. Here's the region you're uh, hiding. And this is the metamaterial here around it. The signal goes round. The problem with this approach is the cloaking material is very wide and the bandwidth is very narrow. A better way to go is with fractals. You take the cylinder and you coat it with the fractals, it's a very thin coating, and it goes around, whoops, around the, around, around the target. And in addition, it has a very wide bandwidth. At L-band, it was demonstrated to have a 50% bandwidth, 50% bandwidth. This is work that Nathan Cohen is doing. And he'll present, and here's his work, the experiment. More recently, he demonstrated this for a flat plate to get invisibility. Now, another way to get low cross-section is to have the material that you're coating the object with absorb the microwaves. And that's what the Chinese have been looking at, using fractals, similar to what Nathan's doing. And they found that doing it this way they get a 10 dB absorption over a <coughs> 2 to 20 gigahertz bandwidth. 2 to 20 gigahertz bandwidth. And 10 dB absorption from 10 to 15. Not only that, it works for all incidence angles and both polarizations. And on top of all this, it's thin, less than one millimeter thick. So you can have it as a coating of an arbitrary shaped object. Could be done for uh, uh, this cloaking could be done acoustics and MIT is looking at that. 
be done at optics and the two universities doing that. There's a company out on the West Coast, Seattle, funded by venture, electric, uh, Electrical Ventures, which is using metamaterials to have low cost, electronically scanned phased arrays to replace the mechanical for satellites and ground systems and airborne systems. It's a high data rate internet through satellites. The Army has on their Jeeps these whip antennas. Whoops, wrong place. They stick way up so the enemy can see you from a long distance. And you don't want that. <laughs> Survivability is minimized. The Army has funded a metamaterial company that's developed a formal antenna that's lambda over 20 thick and goes from 250 to 500 megahertz so you get rid of that whip antenna. Without metamaterials, you can actually now use tightly coupled diodes that have, to form a phased array that has a bandwidth of 1 to 20, a 20 to 1 bandwidth, dual polarized, and a thickness for the highest, lowest frequency of lambda over 4. Amazing, amazing. Truly a wide band. The other thing you can do with uh, negative index of refraction is get focusing beyond the fraction limit. You learn in college that you're the Focusing spot can be no smaller than lambda over two, but with uh, metamaterials, you can get much less than that. Metamaterials aren't new. Marconi has a patent, 1919, using metamaterials for a reflector. The Romans, the Romans, in their goblets, to get the color. They used metamaterials. They had drops of gold and silver through the glass, and that creates the color, depending on the size of the drops. These are the drops, 70 nanometers. The cathedral stained windows are doing the same thing to get the color. The fellow who made the metamaterials popular is the one on the right there. I had lunch with him. MIMO! We had that mentioned earlier. People are trying to use it for radar. And a very large amount of excitement in this field. With MIMO, with conventional radar, you have the same signal going out of each element. With MIMO in radar, you have a different waveform for each element. Noise-like waveform. And they claim that with MIMO in radar, with a high-powered math paper and books, you can get resolution orders of magnitude better than with conventional radar. Orders of magnitude better. The only trouble with that claim is this. <laughs> the math is very good. The math is terrific. The only trouble is the conventional radar they used is not the best you could do. It turns out you can actually have a conventional radar that just, does just as well as the MIMO. So, so much for MIMO. They also claim MIMO can be used for airborne radars to see slow moving targets and the conventional can't, and that it does better for jamming. And those things also are. Not true. I have to say it again. It's not true. There are places for MIMO. If you have a radar in production and you need better sensitivity, you can take the two, two of the ones in production and radiate from both of them simultaneously, and you can get 9 dB increased in sensitivity. So that's an uh, application. And I even have a patent on this. <laughs> so people say I'm against MIMO. Not really, I have a patent on it. <laughs> also could be used maybe for car radars and OTH. 
we're, we're, are there any MIMO readers out there? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I did see a uh, MIMO radar in my travels, though, in Singapore. Where is it going? There, there we go. <laughs> you see that input, output? Input, output? And these bars that go through the front, and he has two in the back. And then he has a whole bunch of arrows going through his back and through his shoulder. He puts the hippies to shame. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's using milk bottles. And you know, only the men do this. The women are smart. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Where is it used in calm? It's okay in calm. You were very proud of uh, our accomplishments in um, Moore's Law and the computers. But you know, brain, our brain, only weighs two to three pounds, only requires 20 watts. To do what our brain does with a computer, actually a mouse's brain, with a present-day computer, would take a computer the size of a small city and many nuclear power plants. So we are really in the horse and buggy days when it comes to computation. We have a long way to go. So what's out there that's gonna help us get to what our brain can do? One is graphene, that's a carbon atom, uh, uh, two-dimensional. Here's the Nobel Prize winner for it, rubbing shoulders with my rub off on me, you know. Quantum computing, copying what the brain does with synaptic transistors, work at Harvard. With Mendristas, you can do in a shoebox what the computer you need to do with a small city and nuclear power plants. Another thing that's going to lower cost is printed microwave circuits. And you're already doing it at 1.6 gigahertz. You can buy a radar, low cost, $90, measure the speed of the ball. You can buy a speed gun that the cops use for 20 bucks. Everybody should have their own radar. <laughs> Uh, I worked at Raytheon, and one of the Raytheon employees beat Einstein. You have to brag about it. Here's the cover of the Microwave Journal. And they have Armstrong on there, Maxwell, all the famous scientists, including uh, Zuckerberg and uh, Bill Gates. And here's Einstein. Whoops. Over here is Einstein. And you look down in the corner here. You know who that is? That's me. That's me. But if you look under the sea here, you know who that is? That's me too. <laughs> I appeared on the cover twice. <laughs> Einstein. <laughs> I also appeared on the cover of the IEEE AESS magazine, dancing. He never appeared on the cover. Sarah Palin. Here, here uh, uh, Bangkok at a radar conference. They played a, a waltz. I had to dance. I found a, one woman who could do that. <laughs> here she is. Uh, she uh, is one of the. She's the school teacher. The, she's the uh, dance teacher who lost the leg in the uh, Patriots Day per, uh, bombing. Uh, dancing with her. Mm. Nice woman. There she is. Uh, radar can get maps from space, as I showed, and also from airplanes. I like this uh, map. One meter resolution. The interesting thing is, this is a very advanced map. The grass is green, the water is blue, and the roads are black. That's really advanced SAR. You can get four inch resolution with SAR now, like optics. 
This used to be super secret. <laughs> Have it, uh, you can use that on the uh, Blackbird aircraft. It's the first uh, stealth aircraft, by the way, as the fellow who developed it. I served on a committee where it was claimed uh, that short pulses can defeat stealth aircraft. And the committee was uh, organized to prove that, whether, to see whether they're right or wrong. We proved that they're not right. The fifth generation of uh, phased arrays is ultra-wideband. Allows you to do multi-functions, as shown here. There are some people working on what's called quantum radars. They claim with quantum radars, you can defeat stealth. <coughs> quantum radars. There are two groups doing this, the Chinese and uh, Western group. I talked to one of the guys from the Western group, and he says recently they proved they only get 6 dB. That's not going to defeat stealth. So, so much for that technology. You can actually put phase arrays under the skin and use it to detect if you need insulin and distribute it, and also see if you need uh, chemotherapy. Here's the radar equation. You gotta see that. Maxwell's equations. Einstein's E equals MC squared. His uh, E equals HF. The IR equation. Now you know everything there is to know. <laughs> now you have to kill us. <laughs> Here's some papers I've written on breakthroughs and on MIMO. Here's my books. You attend my courses, you get free copies. <laughs> a, a paper I published in the uh, Scientific American. 600,000 people get this. It's pretty good. I, I give this talk as a distinguished lecturer for the uh, IEEE ESS. And here I am going around the world fixing radars. Notice my uh, medical. Yeah, take two transistors and call me in the morning. <laughs> so now you should be here. Whoops, right here. Hopefully you're here. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Here. Just want to let you know our rabbits are there. That's the newest technology. So oh, okay. <laughs> they multiply rapidly. That's right. <laughs> Wonderful presentation. Oh, thanks. Thank thank no questions? No. Nope. Well, I can use the uh, for uh, things I need to cover. In the back. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Chip. Eli, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Is it possible to go back to the diffraction limited slide? Is that yes, easy yes. for you? I just want to point something out because uh, people are being misled, <coughs> not by you, by, but by the original <laughs> researchers I would do that. doing that work. No, the, the, the uh, diffraction yeah, I'm trying to get six there. times the diffraction limit. I guess I could do it better here. That's uh, towards the beginning. But, uh, We're talking about the metamaterials. <coughs> Sorry, if it's too hard, we'll, we'll uh. <coughs> Yeah, oh, here we go. I, I, are Almost you there. doing it? Is that you? Oh, no. That's <coughs> okay. Almost. There it there is. It is. That was it. No, that one, yeah. Yours okay. Works better. So what they're trying to show there is that if you're able to improve improve beyond the Rayleigh limit, the diffraction limit, that you can resolve, in this case, two point sources. Right. But right. if you look at it, the intensities are exactly the same. And if you really had super resolution that was practical, you'd be taking all that area under the curve and pushing it into what amounts to two lobes, 
So the intensity should really be much higher. So the trade-off here is they're actually showing that they can resolve better, but the uh, intensity, that is the opacity has gone up. It's not as good a lens as one that doesn't super resolve. So it's kind of misleading the way they showed it. Those two double humps should be through the ceiling, frankly, if there really was an advantage in what they were trying to do. Yeah, you're saying these should be you're higher. you're pushing all that area under the curve. Right up. here, these should be higher. Right Sorry, here. I just want to make that point. Thank no, you. No, thanks, uh, Chip. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh, okay. Yes, a uh, uh, really good talk. Uh, uh, one radar that is uh, famous or maybe infamous for infamous. Ham radio operators was the Duga radar, otherwise known as the Woodpecker. Oh, the I wonder. I, I bet you have some uh, some thoughts about that or some things to talk about. The, no, the that's a uh, that's a classified radar. I don't know too it's much not about classified it. Now. <laughs> it is not. Yeah, it's on Wikipedia. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> WikiLeaks. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Brooker. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Brooker. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.